Today, I'm driving a car, the last of its kind. It's a Peugeot 106, but it's an Aztec SI. In the early to mid-90s, if you were looking at a Peugeot 106, you'd probably already discounted the more normal or mainstream options of things like a Fiesta or a Nova to go for something a bit more interesting, quirky, uh, some Gallic flares, a dynamic chassis dressed in a slightly more interestingly chunky body frame. Well, here it is, the 106, and this is the last of its kind in this particular trim. We'll come to that in a second. The 106 launched as a three-door in October 1991 and a five-door in 1992, and it ran all the way to 2003. And in 1995, they produced 333 of these Aztecs. And this is the last one remaining on the road. Well, the 106 can trace its lineage all the way back to the 104 in 1972, onto the 205 as well. So big shoes to fill when it stepped into that slot in Peugeot's lineup. And it launched the 1 litre, a 1.1, a 1.4 petrol, and a 1.5 diesel. And incredibly, the 1 litre and 1.1 petrols came with a carburettor at first. Hard to believe a car entering the millennium started with a carburettor. Now this particular market segment always has been hugely competitive and there are some really good cars in there. Things like the Micra, the Punto, obviously the Fiesta and the Nova, then later the Corsa, the Citroen AX, the Metro, all kinds of amazing little bits of engineering. So it really has to fight its corner hard and as well as the engineers coming up with a good car to start with, the marketing people had to spin every little plate they could to get these things out of the showrooms. And one of the things that Peugeot was especially good at was coming up with special editions which ran for a limited period and honestly I can't believe they made their money back on the advertising and printing the stickers for them um, compared to the numbers they sold of them. So here it is, this is the Aztec, the special edition from 1995. Now you might even remember the advert where the lady sat in the car with the dark glasses on and the sand dunes in the background you can see reflections of what may be workmen in the jungle doing something and she's talking about her Aztec. Turns out she's at roadworks somewhere in West London probably. But yeah, that's how they launched it to the world and this is what you got. Now bizarrely, there were some complaints at the time and the advert got pulled fairly promptly because they said the Aztec and Inca logos were in some way racist, which may be why there are so few of these cars around. So what did your extra money get you? Well, you've got a spoiler on the back window, you've got your Aztec or Inca logo on the side of the car, coupled with this decal strip, you've got the different steel wheels, and on the front, you've got these front fog lights. And looking at the front of the car, you can see the family lineage so clearly. This is absolutely a 405, a 306. The whole Peugeot family comes together here and you can absolutely identify it with this wonderful design language they had going back in the early 90s, which is just beautifully crisp, very clean, quite elegant. They made some really good looking cars back then. I think the 306 was probably the best proportioned of them all, but it really works in the smaller form factor as well. So here, under the bonnet, we have the Peugeot 1.4 litre. It's a 1360 cc four cylinder inline petrol. Originally, it came with carburetors and made 75 horsepower. Then later on in 1995, gained EFI, fuel injection, and made new power level of 73 horsepower. In the XSI version, ultimately the most tuned is to 95 horsepower, which is quite a significant gain from the same engine. In the back window, we still have the that Wilton or Wilton Cars sticker, a Peugeot main dealer from Southgate, where this car was bought brand new and stayed with its original owner until about a year ago, which is quite phenomenal. Also got the original sticker in the front windscreen. The boot only unlocks with the key and then pushes with the button, so it's pretty old school and basic. And inside, it remains old school and basic. You have direct access to the floor of the car through just a thin vinyl sheet. You have a fold down seat, which just goes down as one individual item, which is not gonna do it right now, because the seatbelt's on. And that's pretty much it, and access to the back of the lights to change the bulbs. The spare wheel, should you need it, is hanging underneath the floor of the boot, so you need to go and get on your hands and knees and get dirty to get that out. No sign of the jack. If anyone knows where the jack is on a 106, let us know in the comments, because the owner doesn't know either, and if he gets a puncher at some point, you might need that. But yeah, there we have the boot. So you climb in using the quite curious little fingertip control handles on the outside of the car and you can see what else you get on an Aztec. Well, you get your three position pop-up sunroof, which I now can't close again. You have to pull a little lever to close it. It's actually a Britax aftermarket, but fitted by Peugeot. And you've got your Aztec logo trim in the door card, as well as the matching floor mats, which this car still has after all this time. You get unique fabric here in the doors and on the seats. You get red seat belts, which is kind of cool. You get a radio cassette. The Inca didn't get one. The Inca didn't come with anything in the dashboard at all. 
Now all of this came for the princely sum of £6,495 and it came with a year's free insurance. So as well as being fun and easy to drive, free insurance made an absolute hit with younger drivers and it became a kind of the youth icon in the 90s. And if you were looking at Max Power Redline Fast Car magazines back in like, the turn of the century, you would see so many of these cars buoyed up with wheels, suspension, body kits, you name it. Now let's have a proper look around the interior. Okay, so first of all, on the door we've got keep fit windows and we've got keep fit door mirrors. Although they're not lean out the door, they're actually on a little protuberance, so at least you're keeping your fingers warm in winter. You've got this, as I say, individual fabric in the door card, which looks quite cool, and a door speaker down here, and a little door pocket, which is just big enough for some cassettes. Uh, quite topically, Roxette's Joyride, which is a great album of the decade. Also quite sad that uh, the lead singer passed away last week. On the dashboard itself, it's very chunky and very angular looking. For such a small car, there are a lot of corners. We've got this kind of trapezoidal looking uh, instrument binnacle directly in front, which has got a nice big clear speedo, nice big clear rev counter, and little kind of semicircular dials on the outer edges for the temperature and for the fuel gauge. And a nice clean strip of lights underneath, nothing on the warning lights at the moment, which is good. On the top of the dashboard, we've got little indents, which don't really do anything here on the right. Such a nice flat area, ideal for putting your sandwiches there. And we have a vestigial tea shelf here going on on the left hand side. If, for example, you happen to have a furious driving mug on you, you have some, oh, a little short. You need to go for the China one, I think, in that case. That's a little too, little too low for a full on tea shelf, but it's a nice idea. It's a worthy effort on Peugeot's part. In the glove box itself, it's just a flat panel which opens to 45 degrees. There's no. No cup holders and picnic opportunities there. Now, as I say, this car does come with a radio cassette as standard as part of the Aztec package. It's one of the early ones of these kind of curiously shaped and formed into the dashboard radios because the 1990s was that period when you had to have your handbag size pull out radio on a metal handle and take it with you when you left the car, otherwise someone would break a window and take it. So it's quite a good idea that they did this kind of weird shaping thing, which has become the fully integrated things we have now. That's got, say, radio cassette, five preset channels and seek tune is pretty basic but it does the job got a couple of big air vents below that and then your heating ventilation set to windscreen and warm because it's four degrees and freezing and frosty today and underneath that we've got these big chunky buttons which look just like the Peugeot 205 unsurprisingly in fact I think if we look back at the video of the 205 convertible I did back in the summertime, this looks like the same panel from memory with the same two blanked off switches which may well be in the air conditioning which it doesn't have. Below that we've got a big pull out ashtray, useful for your change, although you can have to, <laughs> it doesn't have a lighter socket. <laughs> it's like having an airport with only landing not taking off. Uh, that only came on the GTI version of this car anyway, not even the special edition's got, got a socket. So if you want to plug your phone in these days, you need a bit of DIY. On the GTIs and more expensive models, you do have a, another area behind, below this ashtray and control panel, which gives you some more area for controls and cubby holes. Um, but in this one, it's a floating stack with a big, big, big cubby hole beneath that. So you can put sandwiches, phones, chocolate bars, that kind of stuff. And a five-speed gearbox. This is one of the great things about this car. Car. It's such a great driver's car, the five-speed gearbox means it's really useful on the road. And a proper handbrake, which is always good. Directly in front of the instruments, you've got your nice, long, slender control stalks for indicators and light on the left, and horn. Bit poopy, yep. Bit of, oh, poppy, I should say, not poopy. Poopy is something different entirely. And of course, wipers on the right, with intermittent and rear wash wipe on this one stalk. And this steering wheel is fantastic. It's like the 106 Rally steering wheel to look at. It's nice and chunky and grippy. It's just three-spoke thing. It's just ideal for throwing a car through a corner. No airbag, of course, because that didn't happen until the phase two cars, which also got side impact bars in the doors. Now we have these two blanked off panels here, which I'm not quite sure what they do. Perhaps there might be fog lights because the rear fog light switch is down here. But what I thought were front fog lights are actually front spotlights, which come on with the main beam. So you get the full on rally car effect when you hit the big lights. And these seats are extremely comfortable. They're really quite deeply padded and squishy, but at the same time, because they're quite buckety, they grip you very well indeed. And they look great with this unique fabric. And of course you get your red seat belts with this model, which matches the red paint on the outside. Very cool indeed. Let's take a quick squeeze in the back. Now you climb into the back of this car just by lifting a little lever on the back of the seat and it slides forward, giving you access to ah, 
a big squishy bench seat. I can say this with absolute authority because before the current owner who's brought the car along today had it, it had one owner from new and he never had anyone sit in the back seat of the car. And the current owner has had one friend sit in here once briefly. So I'm the second person ever to sit in this seat. In fact, if I move to my right, I'll be the first person ever to sit on that cushion, which is still done up from the last time I had an MOT a year ago. Well, what can I say about the back of the car, apart from the fact it's like new, obviously. Um, well, you have got a nice squishy seat, nice big bench seat. There are only seat belts for two people, interestingly, two inertia reels, nothing in the middle, which is quite curious, I find. Um, they are, of course, the red ones again. Again, quite interesting. Um, there's a little elbow cutout, uh, elbow height on both sides. On the passenger side, it's solid plastic. On the right hand side, there's a little cubby hole. We can just uh, finger deep, you can put odds and sods in there, ideal for a mobile phone. It's like they knew they were going to be invented in 20 years' time and kids were going to have iPads and phones. And just below that, there's a little cutout which is weirdly shaped and sized that you could maybe put a small item like a pack of sweets in there and then have it fall out and get wedged down beside the side of the seat. I'm not quite sure what that tiny cutout is possibly before. Very odd. Now beyond that you have you have non-opening windows. You can see the blanking plates where the hinges might be were it to be an opening window but it's not. And uh, you have no headrests. You have access to the sunroof for ventilation should you require some. I now know how to do this that's good. Um, and that's basically it. You have the same matching mats which I'm again the second person ever to put my feet on this mat which feels a bit sacrilegious to be honest. And you have uh, free and easy access to the um, fossil shelf. So, knock yourself out. As you set off in this car, a couple of things you will notice. First of all, is that the steering wheel is not adjusted. Oh, nice, one, two, three. <laughs> I'm easily distracted. The steering wheel is not adjustable and it is a little bit low on your knees if you're an average height bloke. And secondly, the pedals are offset a bit to the left and they are very tiny indeed. I had not realised this about this car and I've got my size 11 clodhoppers on and if I go for the brake, I have to move my foot away from the clutch first. That's going to be interesting. Now this car has led a fairly cosseted life. It's only got 38,000 miles, one owner I believe, who has looked after it very well. So it is as much as like driving a new one of these as you're going to find really. It's got a nice bit of pull behind it, but the steering, oh my gosh, that's so heavy. Considering it's a tiny little car, it's amazing how heavy the steering actually is at low speed. But then the payoff for that is of course that when you get to the high speeds and the back roads, you're gonna have so much more direct interaction with the car, it's really gonna come alive. And I'm just looking forward to getting out of this resident, residential area, I can't even say that, and uh, yeah, putting it through its paces. I'm going to go full Troy Queef in a minute. Dab of Oppo, etc. Of course, being an early 90s car, there's just a blanked off button for the aircon, and no actual aircon, and uh, I have to flick the, air, the ventilation on a bit higher than I'd like every now and then, otherwise it will mist up. And visibility is really good because it's got nice little slender A and B C posts, so you can really see clearly out the, out the windows. Now on the road, the car just feels astonishingly light. It's like it's made of nothing. And the steering is just, yeah, suddenly very, very connected indeed. Whoa. And even on this really bad road, it feels surprisingly composed for such a small car. It's got no traction control, no ABS, that kind of thing. And on a slippery road like this, it's not got a massive amount of power, but it will still spin a wheel if you try and pull away a bit briskly. Astonishingly, back in 1995, they made an electric version of this. It wasn't very powerful and the range was appalling, and they mostly sold them to the French government. But it existed a long time before the Leaf and the Prius. This gearbox is fantastic and the steering is beautifully connected. You get onto a fast flowing road and suddenly you really feel the car come alive. You know what it was all about back in the day, why people were so keen on these things. The gear change is just a tiny bit notchy when you go into the forward gears. I mean like 135 rather than going forwards obviously. But it's beautifully light. 
Now that little 73, 75 horsepower 1.4 gave this car a 0 to 60 of about 10.2 seconds, which in a car this small does feel quite quick. Also gives it a top speed of 108 miles an hour, an economy of about 45, which is pretty decent. That's MPG Imperial Europe UK if you're watching abroad. But all of that really is just numbers. What really counts is the way it feels, the way you feel so connected to the steering, to the brakes, to the chassis. It's just a wonderful little thing to drive. Yeah, this is another of those cars from that golden period of the early 90s when they still had the lightness of touch of the 80s and were starting to get things, obviously the reliability of the fuel injection and the other sort of clever 90s stuff that was moving into the future and giving reliability and a bit more safety. But still just that lovely connectedness that cars used to have. I'm not being all misty-eyed and nostalgic. I think it is really an unarguable fact that older cars are just more fun in many ways because you can have such a laugh at a low speed. 40 miles an hour in this around a B road feels hilarious to do that in a brand new M5. You're going to be falling asleep. Of course, the downside of 90s design is, of course, that all the ergonomics weren't 100% every time. So things like, as I mentioned, the steering wheel's a bit too low on my knees, this, the pedal's a bit too far off set to the left. The mirrors don't actually rise up high enough for me to see anything else off. There's little curious quirks like that. They make it interesting. It's, it's character, I think you call that. You forgive it because it's more human. Although there is a bit of road noise coming through, it's not madly intrusive, and with the radio on, you'd kind of forget about it. This would be a great all-round car. If it was a first car, a second car for a family, or a fun car for the weekend, this would be a great thing to have. You can go on a long journey in it and not be worn out by it. It's, it's a nice driving position. The steering is a good, so if you're on a motorway, you could just park it at 70 miles an hour and relax, get to where you're going and really enjoy the car. Now, unusually, for uh, my recent reviews, the, the uh, right-hand stalk is the washers and the wipers. Which makes a bit of a change. This really does grip nicely. When you're, even though it's just the tiniest little wheels you've ever seen, little pram wheels, they don't have to take a lot of force from the weight of the car because it hasn't got a lot. And so it just turns in brilliantly. Put a power down and the thing just pulls through a corner. Just a tiny bit of squirm on the wet slipperiness of today because it's pretty nasty out. Also worth mentioning, okay, it's a bit loud when you get to a road like this. Sorry, I spoke too soon. <laughs> worth mentioning on a car of this category, this, this price point, it does have two sun visors as well. Not everything in this market area would have, and it's got mirrors on both sides, which is quite cool. When you look at the spec sheet of a car today, if you go down the showroom and look at the latest Peugeot, it was a 107, 108, whoever it's replaced this several generations on, you've got literally everything. I mean, you're not worrying about whether you've got a 12-volt socket or not. You're worrying about whether you've got Apple CarPlay or Google um, Android or car phone thing, whatever it's called, I've forgotten the name. Um, so looking back to a 90s car, Although this is a special edition with a few extra toys, it's just stunning what you don't get for your money. You don't get central locking, you don't get electric windows. You don't get any kind of boot release other than a key in the, in the back. What you do get is a brilliant chassis and an amazing driving experience. So perhaps people in the 90s were the winners after all. But although you don't get a lot of exciting things, you do get a Jaeger or Jaeger speedometer. That's quite a cool little expensive touch on an otherwise basic car. It's amazing considering how many of these things they, they sold that there are almost none left. I mean, when did you last see a 106 on the road? Never mind an Aztec or an Inca, which just don't exist anymore. I and mean, this is the last ever Aztec in Britain which I think was a Britain-only special edition anyway, so it makes it the last ever Aztec in the world. I should be more careful with it, I'm gonna slow down. Well, thank you for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed this little slice of 90s decadence. A car that was short-lived, but rather special, even if it didn't have electric windows or aircon. It was still a hoot to drive, and I hope you've enjoyed this. If you haven't hit like or subscribe already, then please do, and I'll see you again next time when literally could be anything. Goodbye.